All right, hello everybody. Uh, take your seats, get settled, get ready for the fun. Uh, this is the June 6th meeting of the Rutherford County, Tennessee Public Works and Planning Committee. Uh, welcome everyone. I would like to uh, first on the agenda, uh, get the approval of the minutes. So I will call on Vice Chair Steve Piercy. Chairman Cush, I have reviewed the minutes and I would move for their approval. All right, we have a motion to approve. I will need a second. And we have a second by Anthony Johnson. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All right, that motion passes. Let's jump right into uh, committee reports, planning and engineering. Today we have Assistant Director Danielle. So Danielle, would you please come up to the uh, well and uh, enlighten us, please. So if you look on your iPads, gentlemen, for planning and engineering, where do you want to start, Danielle? Uh, good evening. We only have one item to report tonight, and that's the available lot inventory. For the end of May, we had 868 uh, available lots. This is down by 87 from April of 2023. And so we had a little less. Um, it's gone down, and we do not have any rezonings to report for this month. And that's it. All right. Let's see. Don't go anywhere. Any, Phil, do you have a question? Go yes, uh, there was a, a pool house and a clubhouse on the SharePoint. I know you've, put, you've been pulled, but where was that? Is that Harmony? <laughs> Are you referring to uh, the Las activity? Casas Estates? Las Casas Estates amenity area. That's uh, just off of Las Casas. It, I believe they were called, um, I forget the original name, but yes, that was approved at the Planning Commission. The site plan for that amenity area was approved at the Planning Commission Plats and Plans meeting last month. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, the original name, I think they were referred to as Elmington. It went through a couple name changes, but that's, I think that's the name that was associated with the PUD. And uh, refresh my memory, we do not have a planning meeting in June because we don't have anything to review. No, you have a planning meeting in June. You did not have one in May. There were no cases submitted. And okay. so the uh, Board of Commissioners will not consider any rezonings at their meeting next week. Okay. But we do have a meeting coming up on Monday and we have one case involving a, a rezoning for Flat Rock Road. Okay, thank you, Danielle. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions for Danielle? And we would need a motion to approve that uh, inventory report. So moved. All right. Second. We have a second by Joshua. All those in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you, Danielle. I appreciate that. All right, Tanya, how about a building codes report? And where are you going to start? I'm sorry? Where are you going to start? What tab are you I going am going to start on the permit summary. Okay. So for the month of May, building codes issued a total of 428 building permits and 107 of those for single family dwellings. That's up. Um, Significantly from last year, last year, this month, last year, we issued 76 um, single family dwellings. Last month, we issued 99. So it's, um, the last couple of months have been higher than the previous year. We did a total of uh, 1,932 building inspections, 220 zoning inspections, with a little over 8,000 miles driven. Anybody have any questions on permits issued? 
If not, I'll move on into school facilities tax and development tax. And um, those available lots that Danielle just mentioned, um, I looked, took a quick look at the report earlier and I think about half of those uh, 860 was development tax lots, lots that are still, where the development tax still applies and the other half of them was school facilities tax. Uh, so school facilities tax in the month of May, we collected $1,047,263,000 excuse me, it's $263, and development tax, 6750 That brings us to a uh, cumulative fiscal year total of 5.4. And um, I did a quick total of last year's, and last year, all together, we collected 5.4. We had a small three-building um, apartment complex in Smyrna in the month of May, which um, brought those figures up a little bit. So, um, average- I'm sorry, Tanya, no. 5.4 combined? Yes, yes, combined. To date? To date, yes. And you've, you've got this month One to month get your, your year Correct. done. And what we were looking for six combined was kind of the old benchmark. Yep, and we've been busy the last couple of months, and with the fee increase um, that's effective July 1st, I fully expect um, a heavier load in June because people will try and come in and get their permits before the fee increases on July 1st. So I fully expect June to be a little busier than usual. Anybody have any questions on the school facilities tax or development tax reports? If not, sorry? I'm sorry, what else you got? I'll just move on to zoning enforcement really fast. We had 220 total inspections for zoning enforcement in the month of May. And that concludes my report. All right. Anything unusual about uh, any of those zoning enforcement? No, we're getting into tall weeds and grass and open storage season, so. That's, our numbers typically increase at this time of year. Did you have any noise complaints? We did not have any noise complaints that I know of. Not, none that jumps out at me. I usually try to keep up with generally what's going on, but I can't keep up with every single one. Um, I've, it says we had eight, no I asked, eight, I had several called eight me. noise. We have eight noise inspections, but um, they could have been re-inspections and they could have been new. So I'd have to look in the folder there, the files to find out. But we had eight inspections related to noise ins noise complaints. Do we have any type of noise ordinance on private parties in the rural area? We do not. The only noise ordinance that we've got applies to major subdivisions and commercial. No, sorry, not commercial. Uh, the commercial is addressed in the zoning ordinance. Thank you. Robert, I've got it. I've got a noise complaint I'm working on now that is a reoccurring gun range that came to BZA a couple of years ago that we tried to, squash is not the right word, but try and put some hours or something on it, but it's it's gotten worse. So I'm, my constituent and I are gonna meet with Tanya soon and maybe BZA and see if we can't it's gotten out of hand in a in a subdivision. So. so I will say that the noise ordinance is a private ordinance and can't be heard by the BZA. So a, an appeal um, of a private ordinance cannot be heard by the BZA. The BZA can only hear appeals of the, of the zoning ordinance itself. Just so that would be heard by the um, Adjustments and Appeals Board. Just to let you know, since you're working on this, the county commission can change the County Powers Act and change our uh, sound ordinance at will with a two-thirds vote on the commission floor. Basically, that means that right now it only applies to subdivisions. Major subdivisions, correct. And that could be changed. And like I said, we do not have to go back to the state legislation to do that. It's a private ordinance, so it, c it can always be changed. Once you uh, pass the County Powers Act, Relief Act, 
that section of it, it can be changed, and we've yeah. already done that twice, doesn't matter. Yeah, it'll, yeah, it can be changed. It always could be changed. It's an ordinance, so it can be changed at any time at, at the will of the full county commission. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, uh, any other questions for Tanya and her three reports? Otherwise, I am looking for a motion for approval or denial. We have a so moved, I need a second. We have a second by Commissioner James. All right, all those in favor? All right. All right, thank you, thank Tanya, you. thank you very much. And I'll, I'll be in touch with you very soon for some guidance. All right, do we have a highways report? No, sir, we do not. All right, thank you. Solid waste, Bishop Wagner. And while Bishop makes his way up, I would encourage all the public works folks, particularly the new uh, members, uh, to go have a coffee and a biscuit with uh, Bishop. To, he's been on board for approximately 18 months now. Um, so he's had his time to get his feet wet and create his own vision of what he thinks the department should look like and our vision should be. So uh, go and pick his brain and, and get his input on, on his opinions. Uh, he has some and they're very good. So I'd encourage you all to get to uh, some one-on-one -on -one with Bishop. All right, Bishop, go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Bishop Wagner, I'm your uh, Rutherford County Solid Waste Director. Um, I'll start with uh, the reports, the, the waste collection and recycling report. Last month, Rutherford County Landfill accepted 448.2 tons of brush for a revenue of $13,467. We also managed 2,252 tires for a res revenue of $2,566. The total combined revenue for the month of May is $16,033. Rutherford County Solid Waste disposed of 3,515.17 tons of waste from all sources in, in the month of May. 2,668.56 tons were from convenience centers and 846.61 were were from schools. We recycled 555.23 tons from all sources, and that's a diversion rate of 15% for the month of May, which is markedly up from the nine, nine point, uh, I think it was 9.8 or 9.9 .9 last month. Um, the costs associated with landfill activities this month included $11,200 for manpower and equipment for the brush pile, $3,520 for scale house uh, administrative staff, and $30,526.30 to, uh, to Liberty for tire management. That has us in the net uh, negative $24,010.90. Um, also, um, uh, Commissioner Piercy, I've looked into a, a question that you asked uh, last month about upping the fees and it appears that um, we are, it is within the contract that we have with Liberty to be able to up them to match what we're uh, currently um, being charged by them. So uh, I plan on bringing that up in the next meeting once I've had a little bit of more time to evaluate what we want. The, the, the per ton price is pretty static, but the rate per tire uh, is something that I want to look into to make sure that we're not, uh, we're not overpricing or underpricing uh, an increase for that. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. So that concludes the reports that I have for for this. I have some other uh, two other items to discuss, but if you wanted to, I've got a got a quick question. Uh, you've got down here eight hundred forty six point six one tons from schools. Yes. And is does that include Murfreesboro City Schools? Yes, sir. It includes all the school. The the I take that number based on the materials that I collect, the waste materials I collect from my front load compactors. Thank you. All right, continue on, Bishop. Okay, so the next thing I have, I'll do the the uh, budget amendment uh, first. I have I placed a piece of paper on the table in, in front of you all. Uh, this is a budget amendment that where we will be moving, requesting moving uh, $62,670 from uh, from an asphalt line item that I have within the, the convenience center budget and it will go transfer to other funds to pay for the increased cost of asphalt for the Leanna construction project. All right, any 
Anybody have any questions regarding the need for that? If not, I'd like to get a. I may not have caught that. Where are the funds going to? Where They're going to, uh, they'll be paying a change order for the Leanna Convenience Center construction project. The cost of asphalt was, was quite high. Move to approve, Mr. We'll Chairman. Okay. If we have a motion and a second. We're gonna do roll call on this budget approved amendment since it does uh, have money involved, although it is a transfer. I'm sorry, yes, Phil. Thank you, Chairman. Um, how do you oversee? Uh, how do you oversee a, a change order? Uh, do you see? Th did your contractor present? Did you see the original cost? Did you see the increase? Did they show you the oil index? Then talk about how it went up. So you've got some check downs in there. To, yeah, okay. Yes, sir. And I, I've been I've been monitoring this as it went up. That at one point we were over nine hundred dollars uh, per liquid ton and. Uh, Thankfully, it dropped right before we had to go to purchase, but they did delay it as long as possible to purchase the asphalt and get it in. So I'm continuing to monitor as we go forward, but as, uh, as you know, as oil prices fluctuate, uh, that, that drastically affects the cost of asphalt. There's, a, there's an index we follow. The index we, that we follow, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's go on roll call for the dollars. Mr. Piercy? Yes. Mr. P? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Dodd? Yes. Mr. James? Yes. Mr. Anthony Johnson? Aye. Chairman Cush? Yes. Motion passes. So the final thing that I'd like to discuss is a promise that I made to you uh, almost three months ago concerning a pilot program that we've been running at uh, the weekly convenience center. Uh, where we've been commingling recoverable materials in the central compactor in what's termed as a single stream method. The, the, if you remember, the, the reason behind this was quite simple. Um, we were having problems getting our cardboard to our, to our market. We were turned away from cardboard for a few, at a couple times, and I had to reach out to our partners that we were at the time taking our plastic and our glass to over at WM in, uh, in River Hills in Nashville and asked could they take that, that cardboard and they agreed to do it. Um, once we started bringing that cardboard out there to them, um, I was approached by uh, Mr. Paul Farley who's the manager of that facility and he, he said, well, you know, why, don't, why are you bringing them in in multiple loads? As, as separated, they're all coming to the same area, why don't we put them together? And, uh, and I took a preliminary look at what that would, would look like as from a cost perspective, and, uh, and we decided to do a test to get some numbers. And I've got for uh, two and a third months of, of steady activity with this, I've got some returns on that, which I believe are, are very favorable. So the, the estimated cost per load for a Rutherford County truck to drive to the River Hills facility and drop off, you know, with uh, f just, and this is just fuel and, and man hours on, on that. I'm not including time in this factor and I'm not including maintenance costs in this factor. is $38.44. Since we have been engaged in this activity, we have been able to save 61 loads of material that we ha would have taken to the same area um, to be recycled, but we would have taken them in 61 more trucks. That has saved us um, $2,344.84. Now there's a cost for taking this material to that. Currently we have, we're not under uh, contract with them. We were just taking it to them at, at what effectively would be their gate rate. Uh, the cost for that over this period of time was $2,588.50. So that left us with a net payment out, uh, out of pocket of $243.66 for two and a third months. Now, that in and of itself is a very positive move, but the best part is yet to come. In two and a half weeks, almost three weeks in May, my, the, we collect metal, bulk metal recycling at all of our convenience centers. Uh, the check that we received for, for that, which is a pretty accurate for that period of time, was $3,461.80. So if we take that 
we have made $3,218.14 by using this form of recycling um, over the, the dual stream or the split stream recycling that we were using previously. And that's just with one convenience center. I would like to make a recommendation for consideration of us to uh, expand this into uh, to an action that Rutherford County Solid Waste does and to um, cease with our modified dual stream as we've been doing it and go to single stream recycling at all uh, 15 of our locations. All right, say that, Bishop, say that one more time. Ce cease with the dual stream. Yes, I'd like to cease with our, with our old model, which was the modified dual stream, the splitting up of the commodities, um, with the exception of glass will conti continue to be split um, and we'll continue to keep bulk metal out, the aluminum, uh, tin, cardboard, mixed office paper, and plastics number ones and twos will go into a compactor and be hauled to, uh, to the River Hills facility um, to continue this on. and. Um, which would, there's also, currently we've been paying the, the, the gate rate, and I'm, you know, the, the, the generic cost for this. There's some room in there for us to get that, that cost to us down uh, in a couple different ways. One would be by maintaining a low contamination rate, which this actually helps us uh, operationally in being able to do that, because instead of having to have an employee running around in the lot, uh, checking contamination on the plastic containers and the metal containers and making sure that their bags aren't put in those. They're focused on that one area at the compactor where they can, they can educate the public as well. I'm, I'm confident, and it's the, the numbers are showing too, that we are seeing an, impre an increasing uh, participation rate at weekly because it's, frankly, it's easier for folks to recycle. Um, while they're doing that and they can do it in a line when they, they dispose to the left and they recycle to the right and if there's a, a commodity that they're, they're trying to recycle or wish cycle, they can be told right away, hey, that's not a recyclable material that can either go in the compactor or it can go in an open top container. And, uh, and the, the overall effect is it saves us trips that we've been taking for uh, plastic, for example, is less than a ton. Uh, when it's loaded and we've been hauling less than a ton, basically we're hauling air back and forth to, to Nashville to, to deal with recycling of plastic. And this way it's commingled with, uh, with these other commodities in a you know, seven to nine ton compacted uh, vehicle taken up there and, and dumped out and it's saving us you know, many loads per, per, uh, per turn, so. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so, this this works best if if the recycling could be compacted. Yes, it. it the all? more we can compact it, the the if it's in a compactor, it saves us the loads and everything. I've together. been all four compactors for eight years. I understand because we're not carrying air. We we have solid waste compactors. Mm -hmm. We have heretofore not purchased compactors for recycling. We just purchased some high strength or high capacity compactors. Are we gonna lose some of our solid waste stream converting it to a recycling compactor? That's an excellent question. Um, in fact, I, I am seeing, and it'll take, it'll take a period probably of 12 months for me to get some solid data on what that trend is looking like, but I'm optimistic that the trend is we're going to see less of a, of a pull on our solid waste containers and more of a reliance on the compactors because more people will be participating. Um, and, and that's, we've got some, some ideas at once we go full bore with this from an education standpoint to, to get out to the public to try to get that, to boost that participation up as much as possible. If you have a convenience center and you don't have a compactor, will you carry loose, open top, single stream recycling in the same manner? So I, I have a compactor at every center, so we'll, we'll be able to manage it in that way. Um, the, the parts of the activities where we don't have compaction would be some of the stuff that we pick up for county government buildings and things like that. Uh, I do compact them in our recycling uh, front load truck. So the change to them will be, they'll be placing their single stream materials inside the container that they've been currently using for cardboard only, and we'll, we'll carry it there the same way. 
Chairman. If you don't mind, go over one more time exactly how you're, say I'm, I, I recycle. Yes, sir. And doing the single stream, I understand, you know, glasses over here, cardboards over here, papers over there, plastic here, aluminum's there. So you're saying plastic, paper, aluminum, and cardboard all go into one, and glass is the only separate entity. That and heavy uh, metal objects, too. Yes, sir. That would be separate. But plastic, paper, aluminum, and cardboard can all be in one. Right. Yes. Just want to make that clear. And, and so what happens is it gets taken in our compactor containers and it gets dumped out on their tipping floor and then it gets fed into to a hopper onto an automated belt that separates these commodities out uh, individually using all kinds of, of technologies. Um, and by the time it gets to the end of the line, everything's so separated out individually, it's bailed and it's ready to be hauled to its, its customer, its end of life thing. So it's a, it's a business model that uh, recycling companies use and this is something that, frankly, we were, we were taking the material in a, in a, in a modified dual streamer in, in different containers and we were dumping it on the same tipping floor as Davidson County, which was collecting it collecting it single stream, and the only thing we were doing was losing those loads, the, the amount of loads and the load counts that we're getting there. You said our tipping floor. I wasn't aware oh, that we have no, a no, tipping floor. No, no, I apologize. The tipping floor that we're, we're using there, the, the, recycling, the recycling tipping floor, not, not ours. There's an exception on that plastic Chairman, there's an exception on the plastic, it's one and two, right? That's correct. That's and no, no medicine bottles? Or? If they're, and depending upon whether they're ones or twos, and some of them are and, and some of them aren't, the, the issue really is not in can these things be recycled. It's a, the matter is, is it cost effective to recycle these materials and do they become a recoverable material when they get to the materials recoverable facility or do they become waste? And if you run uh, um, what we call a MRF, Materials Recovery Facility, and you have materials that you can't, that aren't saleable, they end up having to get transported and, and landfilled. So there's a cost that comes back on us. Uh, that's a contamination rate cost if we don't adhere to those. Um, I'm sure that every recycling MRF in the country, if they could come up with a way to make it profitable to recycle those five through sevens and, and some of those others, they would absolutely do it because um, they want to recycle it and divert as much as possible. It's just there's no market out there for the majority of those materials, um, at least in the southeast region. Plastic bags, the film things like you get at Kroger or Walmart or whatever, can you put those in the recyclable? No, sir. They they become a problem with the with the collection and the conveyor equipment. Well, that, that was my assumption. I just wanted to be clear since I said plastic. So, vice chair. So, in the past, where we've been taking our recyclables, are we having to pay a fee to leave them leave it? For, for the glass and the plastic, which are the, the plastic is the least weight and the glass is the most weight. We've been paying for for that the tipping fees for for years. What about um, our cardboard? Cardboard has been, sometimes we receive, receive returns, um, sometimes we, we receive large returns, and sometimes we receive very minimal returns. When it comes to a net um, cost, we, for the last 11 months, it's been a net loss for us on our, with our uh, transportation cost. And then there were two instances where the vendor we were utilizing couldn't accept our materials, so I was left with generation and no outlet, which prompted us to, to, to test this out in the first place. And the aluminum's the same way? Aluminum is, is, so aluminum is a little bit different because yes, you can make money on aluminum, however, it, it requires a lot of it because it's light as well. Um, from, the, from our metal vendors that get it, they'll accept it, but it becomes kind of a time problem for them. So where we were having issues with our aluminum was I'd have to schedule or call ahead to make sure they could accept material, which really affected our ability to, to dispatch those loads out. Um, so if, if, for example, I had a, a loaded 
uh, metal bin at, at Craner Road, for example, and, um, and I would go to dispatch a driver to go out there, we'd have to call ahead to, uh, to Clark Metal and say, are, are you able to accept this? And if they were, they'd take it, and if they weren't, we couldn't pick it up, which could throw off that whole cycle. So the amount of money that we saved that we made in hauling it was de minimis compared to um, the amount that we'll save in commingling. You're willing to change all our convenience centers over to this model? Yes, sir. Have, have you done a 12-month study to see what that will save us? Uh, so I've got, I can extrapolate what I've got from the 2.33, um, you know, effectively from the two, three, three months that we've done it. I haven't had 12 months to test it, but uh, we're looking at, we'll be, it won't just be saving us money, we'll be generating positive revenue in the tune of, uh, I'm just looking at the number, running it in my head, 12 to $15,000 a year. So recycling will net return us money where we've been losing money. But is that based on our heavy metal? That's based on the. That's based on us getting our heavy metal, and honestly, that's that's probably low because my metal intake is only based off of a portion of that period of time. So we can probably look at the last sheet that I saw with the compiled metal. I was over a hundred thousand dollars for the year in positive. Now that fluctuates as well. So yeah. metal's been trading very well lately too. So I don't want to set the bar too high on what to expect with that, but I feel confident that um, in this model with just the savings that, we, that we're making off of not having to send loads, and the other factor that's equally important to me outside of the money is having our drivers in the county to be able to service our convenience centers, our solid waste uh, needs without getting in, like currently, um, we're, we've been inundated with waste over the last last couple of weeks, I don't know whether it's summer vacation and people cleaning out their house or whatever, but our open top containers are getting to that, that dangerous level again today where we're having to do, do things a little extra. This will take that burden off of us where we're having to take these individual containers and lose, you know, a minimum two hours, one hour up there and one hour back to take our stuff to market. Um, we're able to allocate that vehicle to manage our, our waste for, for our citizens. So basically, our metal is going to bring the same. Your savings is going to be trips back and forth to Nashville. Absolutely. Yes. You made the comment a while ago that we're not under a contract. What will a contract look like? The, uh, the manager's here tonight. Can can he tell us? Can you tell us? If y'all would, if you're well, if you would like to come up here and discuss it, you're welcome to come up. If that's all right with you, Chair. Yes, sir. Yep. Do we need to suspend the rules? Sure. Make a motion. I'd, I move to suspend the rules, let him come to the well. All right, all in favor? Aye. Come on up state, and state your name. Yeah, had to be Steve. Good afternoon, I'm Paul Farley. I work for WM, uh, manage the recycling facilities in here in Nashville. So with a contract, we would, we would cover the processing cost. We have a set processing cost per ton. Uh, we would allocate that right off the forefront, and then we would do a revenue share or a, a value blended uh, based on what your commodities are, so what your actual stream is. We would do audits on your material and say you've got X percentage of cardboard, plastic paper, and then we do a revenue share based on that. So there's a good chance there would still be a tip fee. Uh, I can't give you an exact number of what it'd be because I'd, I'd have to do audits on your material, but it would be uh, based on your material. Currently, we're at $50 a ton tip fee, which is a standard rate, uh, but the, the tip fee would be based on your material. I mean, it could be $30, $40 a month, depending on the markets, but it would, it would definitely, current markets, it would be better than a $50 a ton tip fee rate where it's at right now. So basically all we're going to bring you is the cardboard, plastic, uh, aluminum, is that it? Plastic, cardboard, paper, all of your office paper, mixed paper. So we currently are only doing plastics ones and twos. Bishop had mentioned number fives. As anybody noticed on plastic bottles, you've got the ones through, through seven. Uh, you know, we will eventually be doing number fives. We're looking to add other streams to the commodity. Uh, and as we add streams, those will be able to come out of the waste stream. Uh, but currently, we're just doing the ones and twos. Thank you. Anyone else?
All right, uh, we'll call the meeting back to order. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. So Bishop, here, this is what I've heard, so let me, let me repeat. You have started a pilot program and you're months into it and you have seen enough success and trend that you're asking this committee to go full bore on all convenience centers. And at those convenience centers, you currently have the equipment to handle it, right? And if I heard right, you think it's actually easier for our constituents that use the convenience center to, to process their own recyclables the way the pilot program lays out. Did, is that a yes or a no? That's correct. And uh, there is, to be completely transparent in here, there will be a, a learning curve. Initially, what we experienced was there was about three weeks where the regular recyclers, we had to, to train them and let them know what was going on. Um, the folks at WM have, have offered their assistance to be able to help us educate the public by coming out and doing kind of some presentations at our centers and helping uh, them see them see what the what the you know where the material goes kind of show them show them exactly what's happening to where because a lot of the, the issues that we had when we started out at weekly was people thought that because it was going into a to a waste compactor that it was going to it was going to landfill and being landfilled and that's um that is in fact the opposite of what's happening it's we're we're trying to increase the ability for right. for them to recycle and and Two of the added benefits on your pilot program have been, A, you're actually making some additional monies, right? And m maybe more importantly is you're reducing the number of truck trips and man hours significantly. Is that a fair statement? Yes, sir, that is. Okay. Um, for that, I want to, A, congratulate you on your, your vision and thinking outside the box to even begin a program like that. Uh, so I, I compliment you on your efforts. Uh, is there anything else you would want to report on this before I ask for a motion? I've got another question. Sir. Yes, sir. Committee, Mr. Vice will, will this enable the majority of the school trash to go, go to this? It, in the same method that we'll pick up, that we'll do for the, uh, for the county buildings, that as well. I want to see the schools putting their, uh, their single stream in, a, in their recycling containers. And what I hope to see is more single stream recycling containers at the schools and less waste containers at the schools because they do generate a large bulk of the recoverable materials that we collect in the, in the county through our, when we use our open top school stuff. Well, that brings up a good point. The school does not mix their food waste with, with uh, Papers, do they? Okay. No, currently they, they separate their, their MSW from their cardboard, but there, there is a lot of plastic, there's a lot of office paper that ends up getting into the, that doesn't make it into the, the recycling that we'll be able to capture in a single stream method easier. Can we encourage the city schools to do that since we picked their trash up? I think we could find the city being, a, being an ally in this as well, because they also have a vested interest in, in maximizing their diversion, um, especially with some of the things that are on the horizon with, uh, with solid waste management. All right. Joshua, go ahead. Robert. Well, are we going to sign a, a contract that would limit us, for instance, if we said, hey, NBL, sitting here and we want to sign a contract with them is that gonna uh, if we do this agreement with this company here is that going to keep us from being able to go to an alternative uh, waste system if next month or two we decide to go to that I, I haven't seen the contract nor the terms of the contract on either way so I can't speak to what that would that would look like I think the question would be probably was if we could find a, a solution that was already here and available that's making positive revenue for the county, would we need to go to a, a third party to be able to reach these diversions? And I don't question that. I think that you're headed down the right road here. I just don't want to tie our hands if we say, hey, we're going to do this for a year. Or we're going to be tied up for years, my question. If you can't answer that, I can't vote. We, I mean, it, uh, of course, any contract can go for any length that you that you negotiate in the contract. If the if the body determines a year is the appropriate time for us to to engage in the first one to see how it goes, I think that you know we could probably work something out. I know that that probably wouldn't be as favorable a contract as a multi-year contract would be. Um, however, you know, given the net 
savings, I think we could still do well on a, on a shorter term, but we could call it a tester contract if, of course, they were willing to, to engage in, in such contract. Joshua. I was wondering if we go through this, this process like you're proposing and the numbers skew and it's not as valuable to us to continue, is there a cost to going back to what we're doing now? No, uh, the, cost, the cost will be going back to the old way um, as far as, because we will be then adding more loads to our, to our staff. The savings here isn't in, in the, the tipping fees and honestly it's not in the, in the contract itself with, with the, the, it's in the savings that we have for the load counts and, uh, and even larger than that, it's in the time and the amount that, because if I've got to add four positions to be able to keep up with volume, that are that are coming and I'm gonna tell you I've been working magic over the last 18 months to try to avoid having to to be able to keep up with what we have with the volume that's increasing um, this is one more step toward uh, toward us maximizing our our movement power our waste movement power that we have uh, and at and, and this is a conservative number 38 point uh, Thirty-eight dollars and forty-four cents per load to Nashville. If I'm got over two and a third months, I've got uh, sixty-one loads saved for one convenience center. Um, that's a significant amount of, of trips, significant amount of mileage, and we're in tear in our trucks. And it's a significant amount of of uh, time that we'll have those drivers that were previously dedicated to those loads in the county able to manage the waste streams that are here. All right. Any other questions? I'm gonna, oh, yes, Jeff, Chairman. Bishop, could you explain again the pilot program? You're putting all the recyclables in one particular uh, compactor and you're taking it someplace. The other convenience centers, where is that someplace? Where's all of those materials going? It's all been going to the same location. Everything is going to the same location. It's just the method in which it's being carried there uh, and collected is different um, because we were currently, you know, using that other stream and before we made a, what this would be as a, a paradigm shift in the way that we, we collect and manage these materials. Um, that's so, cur so currently it's not going to our landfill? No, it is not. Everything is being recycled. So nothing would change other than the method of getting those recyclables to some other place. That's correct. How does, how would this process fit into our long-term garbage disposal plan? How would it fit in with uh, the conversations we're having now about a transfer station? I'm glad that you asked that question. So part of the the deal with the transfer stations will be having to eventually pay for managing waste. With, if we can divert as much material as possible from that waste stream, there are two main mechanisms for doing that. The number one best mechanism for diverting waste into recycling is to do a curbside recycling collection program. We're in the county, we're currently not in a position where, where we're able to do that right now. Uh, so the second best option is to, to maximize the amount of diversion we can get is to make it as easy and convenient for the citizens to recycle as much material as possible at our, uh, our convenience centers in our location. So the, the people that would normally not, because we have our, we have our, our, our diehards, our, our avid and, and responsible recyclers that are out there today that, that we come to our centers every day um, that have their, their commodities separated, they know where everything goes and they do that. And that makes up about a third, a, maybe a heavy third of the people that come to our, our convenience centers. Now, there is also probably another fifth of the total people that come in there that recycle here and there and when they think that they can. Um, and then there are some that don't know what recycling is, try to recycle from time to time, but end up doing it wrong. So what we're hoping to be able to do is take that, those percentages and get them all recycling. Uh, I would like to see a number which was in the 15s this, this month um, and I'll say it was in large part to the participation that we've had at Weekly on this project. I would like to see those numbers get up into the 25s, 30%s. Then we're talking about some real diversion. Um, and that's, that's real tons from the real waste stream that we would have to be paying uh, disposal tipping fees if we were in a position to have to do so. 
maybe one, one other follow-up. Long term, um, and, and I'm talking long term, mm -hmm. uh, if, if, um, if we build a transfer station and we divert recyclables from that transfer station, a continuation of what we're doing now, just doing it a little differently, and the rest of that garbage, uh, where does that go? Uh, it, it will go to an end-of-life facility. There, you know, so, there can be different options for that as well. I mean, I, there are there's some discussion with the city of Murfreesboro and a facility that they may be building that would accept some of our waste streams. Uh, we still have a have a relationship with uh, Republic Services for our municipal solid waste while they're while they're open for our residentially generated waste. Um, and then the other waste streams that may come to us from commercial avenues or industrial avenues that come to our transfer station for processing. And there's another, another elephant that I'd like to discuss on, on with the transfer station aspect is there's been a large commodity that we haven't been able to manage adequately in the time that I've been here that personally bothers me, and that's the construction and demolition debris, uh, particularly the residentially generated construction and demolition debris that uh, if I get, I had a call this afternoon where I had um, a citizen that had a half a truckload of, of wood in the back of his pickup truck and he reported that, you know, of course we don't take it at our convenience centers um, and that's surely a volume issue. I can't, I can't, I get inundated with it and we can't manage it. Um, and we refer them to go uh, over the scales to Republic Services and, uh, and he went over there and he was charged the, the fee to manage it and he called and, and you know, was angry because he's paying to get waste disposed that was generated from his home. And, uh, and you know, I'm in a tough spot there because I agree with them. Uh, I think that if it's generated within our home, if I, if I remodel uh, my, my garage or my, my bathroom and I've got some, some stuff that I've done myself and I'm not a contractor, I should be able to, to dispose of that um, in a way that doesn't cost me an arm and a leg. And, uh, and unfortunately, in our current situation, we're not able to do that. I feel there's a strong avenue for us to be able to do that uh, with the transfer station, um, to be able to, to get the public back engaged with, with that and, become, and bring that service back to the citizens of Rutherford County. Is it smart for us to jump into this thing I think that question has been asked. Is it smart for us to jump into that thing right now, or would it be better for us to expand uh, the pilot program uh, to other facilities for another six months or so, and then report back as to how that's going? You'd rather just jump in the deep water and and see how it goes? Well, I'm... <laughs> I don't know, I like how you put that, but uh, the, I feel like I'm always in the deep water, honestly, uh, Chairman. The, I feel confident that this pilot is indicative of what we could expect long term with this and that we would stand more to gain by, there's, there's a couple things that, right now I've got one center that's different from the others and we've been able to manage expectations of the public based on that. Um, if we go to half of the centers or a third of the centers to, to do this, to extend this, what we end up getting is confusion about, you know, what's an acceptable commodity. And we don't gain the benefits of the reduction in load counts to the degree that I think would, would, be, would be the best benefit for us. So um, I recommend that we, that we go all in on it. And I, I agree with, with Prudence uh, from, uh, for, uh, I think that that Commissioner P is right. Um, you know, if we can get a, a shorter term contract to start to see how it works over a period of time, I think that would be prudence. We could have 12 months of uh, data set and we'd be able to see it next budget year how, how that uh, positively affected the solid waste budget. Um, I think that's, that would be a, a solid argument. Um, but it, it ultimately, it's up to you, to you all. I just wanted to bring you the information that we've gathered and, and let you know um, that there are other options out there for us. I appreciate that. And, and, but if, if we do get this short-term agreement, um, isn't that the same as a pilot program? 
I, I mean, I guess we could call it semantics and say that. Um, I, f I feel confident enough to say that we'll call it a pilot program for the first year and it will become a regular part of our, our solid waste programming in the future because I'm confident that this is successful. Chairman Kush, do we meet in July? We do not, do we? I don't believe so, no. We, we can, but we don't typically. Okay. Will they take our recycles from all the convenience centers till we come back in August to extend your pilot program for the full show and give them time to bring us a contract to look at? I'd really like to look at something before I approve it, especially on a contract on how long, you know, six months, 12 months, is it breakable? At what expense would it be broke? Will they will they take our take our trash from all of them like that? Yes, sir. I'm sure. Time? I'm sure they they would do that for us. I would make that motion, Chairman Cush, for us to go ahead and allow him to let all of our convenience centers go to the collection like the pilot was till we come back in August and let them come back with a contract and present it and then vote on the contract at that time. We have a motion and a second. Do we discussion. have discussion? discussion. Uh, Commissioner P asked if this recycle program would affect a contract with MBL and I reached out to get the answer to that and the answer was no, it would not affect the contract. So good with that. Right. And before, well, I, 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 yes, I'm sorry, Joshua, go ahead. I'd like to know if we could uh, to uh, amend that motion just a bit by um, duplicating the, uh, the 2.33 that we did with one center, the exact time frame for all centers, so we can compare both notes from one to all for the same time period, if that'd be uh, feasible to you. They'd be amenable to that as well. They're going to all be the same if it's for two months running. Because we don't come back till, till August. Yeah, effectively, you'd be losing a, a third of a month. So that, that'd be within the skew of margin. Oh, so I rescind that. I see. Okay. The other small part of this that we haven't talked about is you know, for years we've talked about the need to educate the, the county, the constituents about recycling. This is a small step, but it is a step in training people or getting people in the habit of separating the, the although this is a single stream, but still there are certain things that need to go in that single stream and certain things that need to go in the bin. This is a training opportunity and if you're, in, if you're consistent in all convenience centers, then there is no confusion, like you said. So this is a, a, a training opportunity for our folks to get in the habit of knowing what is recyclable and what is not. So, all right, let's, uh, let's go to vote. All those in favor of that motion, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. That's Bishop, all I have, that's let's, all I have, thank let's, you. Uh, let's vote on your reports, make a motion to approve your reports. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? Thank you, Bishop. Good wait, evening. wait. Before he yes, leaves, sir. I'd like to hear where we are on our recycle, on our uh, transfer station. What stage are we at? If, if uh, you could forego the rules, I've got uh, they're present in the audience, and so maybe they can give a slight update. That would be fine. Motion to suspend the rules. So moved. All right. All those in favor? Thank you. Come on up. If you would introduce yourself again to the group, pretty soon we'll get to know you by, uh, yeah. You got my slides, sir? No. Okay, uh, evening everybody, gentlemen, ma'am. I'm Dan Salisbury from h and Engineering. Uh, again, we're the company that you hired to design, permit, and prepare for bid the transfer station. Um, we don't have my slides, but just to reorient you where the, where the transfer station is going to go. Uh, use Walter Hill Convenience Center as your landmark. Go south on Landfill Road, past Middle Point, past the county landfill. You hit the uh, county solid waste building. Go across the scales, as soon as you pass those scales, look to your left or south, and that's gonna be the location for the transfer station. Um, some of the updates from the last briefing in May. 
so a few days after we briefed uh, last time, uh, we met with your solid waste director. Um, that same day we had our geotechnical engineer here, um, came down from New York, uh, and he oversaw the boring operation where they're digging in the ground to do the soil analysis. Uh, those soil samples went to a, uh, a laboratory and our uh, geotechnical engineer should be finished up with his report, his follow-up report from that uh, boring operation here pretty soon. So we'll have the results of that soon. Uh, I'll just hit the highlights from, from what I had on the slide. Um, so I, I mentioned at the last briefing that I reached out to CUD, submitted a water availability request um, to see if we could get water down Landfill Road to the new location. Uh, long story short, um, I don't think it's gonna be a feasible option, uh, both um, with the water pressure that they could provide uh, without some serious infrastructure upgrades, I don't think they're gonna be able to provide the, the amount of, of water uh, that your fire marshal requires. Uh, and we're also gonna have to, to pay to dig that water line down 1.65 miles down Landfill Road, which is anywhere from 850,000 to a million uh, just, to, just to dig that line. And if we dig the line without the upgrades, we're not gonna be able to meet the water pressure needed. So I, we're, gonna, we're not gonna completely kill that, but we're gonna, we're gonna mark that as probably not a feasible option. Um, so we are, um, we also talked at the last meeting about the southern route um, going onto the river. I've got information out to two different companies waiting on quotes back to get um, a little further. We had a rough quote of what it would cost, but just to get some more specific uh, exact quote on what they're gonna charge us to bore under the river for the water and the sewer line. Um, also the Army Corps of Engineers, we'd also talked about using a dry hydrant at the last meeting. Uh, so we submitted all the paperwork. They came back, asked for some more information. Um, they still have a little bit of work left to do, uh, checking the, uh, make sure there are no endangered species, uh, checking the national historical record to make sure that we're not gonna impact any facilities, which through my open source research, uh, research the closest historical location is across the river over on the VA hospital footprint. So that shouldn't be an issue, but we're, at this point, we're just waiting on the Corps of Engineers to come back uh, and let us know how to proceed with which nationwide permit uh, we're gonna pursue to make that dry hydrant happen. And again, that dry hydrant was gonna be non-potable water. That was gonna be to um, help replenish um, a water tank for any fire suppression we needed and also for uh, the wash down water, estimating anywhere for be between 1,000 and 5,000 gallons per day uh, for those two different services. And, and that's what that dry hydrant would provide us with. Um, we also met, um, I had a, you, you'll get the slides later, you'll be able to review that and, and hit me up if you have any questions on any of the other updates. But um, Ray and I met with TDEC this morning to check on our permit uh, for the transfer station. As of last week, the permit, they had finished the review on the permit and they afforded uh, um, the, the field office is who we spoke to. They afforded that to the central office and the central office has to review it. Uh, and if there are no issues within a, a, week, a week or so, we should have our permit. Um, so once we get that permit, um, we are going to, we will need to, um, go back to TDEC and submit a, a septic field request if we end up going with a septic field, which I had on, on the chart, if you remember from last time, um, our stormwater permit. Um, once our site design is done, I'll be able to submit the, the county paperwork uh, for constructing this transfer station. Um, trying to think what else was on that slide. I think that was about it. So those are some of the next steps coming up. Um, the site design, we should be done um, in the next couple weeks with the site design. And then I'll be able to submit all those other, for all those other permits. So overall, we're a little ahead of a schedule. Um, we, we are gonna, kinda going worst case scenario with TDEC with how long it was gonna take them to review the packet and give us a permit. Um, but we're a couple, ahead, couple months ahead of schedule on that. So um, subject to any questions, I guess that's the quick update. I guess the other open issue um, that we mentioned last time and, and he kind of touched on a little bit was that RFP. So just wanted to highlight that, you know, the, our, our part, our contract with this transfer station does not solve your problem. That the next step of this is that RFP to figure out who's gonna haul your, the, the, the MSW and the C&D waste that goes through this transfer station and then who's gonna dispose of that. So we, that's still kind of out there. Um, a task that needs to be done um, beyond 
the design and permitting and building of the transfer station. Any questions, gentlemen? Would there be any need of doing an RFP before you get your permit? Before we get the permit? Right. Um, yeah, it, basically that RFP um, is going to, um, it, it's just going to get interest and costs for what it's going to cost you to, to haul away and dispose of that. So I don't, I don't think there's any harm at all in putting that RFP out there um, before we build this transfer station, no sir. Does that answer your question? I think it's something we could do. We could do today if 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 you guys are ready to do that. Chairman, the uh, the water line that you were talking about is that just for fire services? Or you're not going to need a, a this. capacity just for uh, say a bathroom. What we had we had talked about that with CUD, if I'm understanding your question correctly. Um, that that if we if we did the water line, I guess from the north or the south, um, that would um, it it would be the non potable or the, the 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 city water would be the potable water, right? Um, versus a dry hydrant for the for the wash down that would be non potable water. Is that, well, that that was my that question about the. Uh, the dry hydrant, what's the use for that? Is that for fire protection or is that for auxiliary use in the building? We, we had intended on that on the dry hydrant to be for the wash down water because there's every, every day they're gonna have to wash down the tipping floor, the concrete floor to get all the residue off, which will then go into a drain and go into a leachate tank, uh, which will be collected and taken off because that's gonna touch trash, right? So that becomes um, water that we need to treat. Um, but that, that's what we intended on the dry hydrant to do is, is any fire suppression, uh, if that needs to go in a tank for fire suppression needs and or the, uh, the washed on water. Well, even if you were using potable water, you would end up having to go in the leachate tank if it was used for wash down, right? It, yes, correct. Yeah. Any, any, any liquid that touches trash is going to be, is going to be leachate. Yes, sir. Okay, I, I just wanted to make sure I was understanding what water was being used for what purpose. So, thank you. Where will the water come from for the dry hydrant? I must have missed that. So the dry hydrant would be um, anywhere from a four inch to a six inch plastic pipe that would go about 10 to 15 feet out into the, the river, the um, um, Stones River, I'm sorry. Um, and then that would, that plastic pipe would be connected to a pump, which would sit on a concrete pad on the bank or, or on land. Um, and that would pump the water out of, out of the river um, up to the transfer station location to wherever that tank is that's gonna, that's gonna collect the water. Does that make sense, sir? Does that answer your question? I understand what you said. Would it not be more environmental friendly if we dug a lake and pumped the water to the lake and then to the to the facility uh seems like it kind of be one the same if, if you're going to pump it to a lake or you're going to pump it to a, a tank and then and then it would be used out of the tank or the lake if you used a lake so I, i'm not really sure of the difference um other than i mean a lake would be, be evaporate and collect bugs and all kinds of other stuff that the tank wouldn't necessarily do. Is this something that will have to be permitted to do this? Well, yeah, that's why, I, yes, sir. That's why I went through the Corps of Engineers. That's why I submitted the paperwork to them to make sure that they were okay with us doing that. Um, I can't remember the designation that, that my contact there said the, the, the Stones branch was, um, but he, he was, that's why we're going through all the submitting all the information to them to to make sure that we're we're going to be able to one install that into the river and then two we're going to be able to pull that amount of water out of the river. So yes, sir, we're going through the Corps of Engineers for that for that process. I don't know of any other permitting process unless the county has one. I'm not aware of, um, but right now we're going through the Corps of Engineers. Yes, sir. Like I said, if you, if you get the slides, and there, there's probably a, a 
bigger list on there of stuff we've done since the last update. If you have any questions, just reach out. I'm local, so just reach out and let me know. Happy to answer your questions. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm gonna call the meeting back in order. Thank you. If I could just kind of follow up, you, you mentioned earlier um, about um, waste, maybe through the transfer station in coordination with what Murfreesboro is doing. That's the first time I've heard a coordination with Murfreesboro, the first time. So is there some coordination with Murfreesboro as it relates to their transfer station? Are we having conversations with them so that uh, we know that kind of we're on the same page with Murfreesboro? Are, are, we, are we doing something in coordination with Murfreesboro uh, so that our transfer station and their transfer station won't be opposing units uh, versus coordinating units? That, that, again, that's an excellent question. Um, so from, a, from an interlocal agreement standpoint, we haven't engaged any further in that to my understanding, but from a communication standpoint that, that we've had with the, the members of, of Murfreesboro and their intentions with the creation of their transfer station and uh, the associated waste away uh, facility. I'm still operating under the same, um, the same knowledge that was offered to us by Mr. Darren Gore about uh, should the waste away project go into effect um, as anticipated, it will op offer us an option to be able to take uh, waste there for a rather large diversion ratio on top of a low, uh, tipping fee. Now, are we, we're not engaging in any contracts with them currently. Um, we're not talking to them about uh, any collective bargaining agreements or anything of that standpoint, but we're both under the understanding that um, we plan on working together in whatever way works for both entities when it comes to uh, managing the waste that's generated in the county and in the city. Um, similar to the way we, we have been in the past, uh, I think there's, and I, I I think Darren Gore has shared this as well. You know, there's value in us working together to try to, to get some of the better deals that we can on some of the, the removal of these commodities and, and the end of life facilities for these commodities as well as, uh, as maximizing our diversion opportunities. Operating costs for the transfer station, have we put any final figures on that? Do we know what op annual operating costs are going to be? I think a large factor in that operating cost is going to come from uh, once we get some end of life and hauling numbers back from the RFP process. That That's something that that uh, our, our folks over at H&A &A will be able to help us get a, a solid number together on what that's going to look like from an op operational perspective. The, the model is going to be in the pro forma uh, that will be generated uh, within that will have to come after we get those solid numbers. There's a lot of conjecture in, in reaching out at what these costs are gonna be ahead of time. Um, what, I've, what I've chosen to do in this project is to com compartmentalize each, each activity as a separate cost and, and I have confidence that if we, if we uh, my grandfather said, if we watch the pennies, the dollars take care of themselves, I, I have a feeling that if we do things at the maximum efficiencies as we're going forward, by the time we get to, to that part and get those solid numbers together, we'll have, uh, the, uh, have a real clear picture of what that's gonna look like for us. And we'll be in a better position as well with that knowledge to be able to reach out to partners like the city of Murfreesboro to see uh, what, what uh, you know, do we want to do an interlocal? Are those things that we can work together on? Hey, just, just one more follow-up, and this is an observation, and it, you may have a totally different view of this. We build a transfer station, uh, Murfreesboro builds a transfer station, and we divert waste to uh, some form of, of energy production, okay? That's a lot of waste uh, a lot of garbage that will not be going to middle point, okay? Yes. We realize if this is going to happen, that regardless of how you, how many years you think that middle point has left, me personally, I think it's the five years, 
And if, but if it is two and a half, I think our, our chairman believes that's closer. Uh, it doesn't matter. If we start diverting waste from Middle Point, the extension of the life of that landfill could go, and that's a significant amount of waste. So the, the life of that landfill will be much longer or could be much longer than two and a half years or five and a half years. So diverting that waste from Middle Point will extend the life of Middle Point an, an undetermined amount. So instead of Middle Point closing in two and a half years or five and a half years, whatever the ca case may be, it could be that Middle Point will still be in operation receiving garbage from s other places than Rutherford County for years to come. Well, so you raise you raise a, a good point as always on this. Let me uh, let me be be I think a little clearer than I was in the last time we discussed some of this stuff with End of Life. So I want Middle Point to be open five years. I like the idea that we're not having to pay tipping fees on a residentially generated MSW. Um, if they're open for five, seven, ten years, that's money that the county is saving and managing their waste. Um, I, I don't believe that that's the case, and I've stated that previously, but um, I want it to be. Um, in my role here as your solid waste director and the citizens that I serve, I, my, I view my job, and I may be in error here, but I view my job as being the guardian of injury in the field of my expertise to the public that I serve. And the question that, that I ask myself is, is there reasonable, if, if I take the construction projects that we're currently under and I look at the time that it's taken over what we anticipated for those constructions due to, to to factors outside of the control of the county. I mean, we did a good job getting things through and getting them, getting them out there, but just the construction process in and of itself is slow. If we get to that, that point there, are we putting ourselves in a position where we could risk placing our citizens in an area where they don't have control over a contract? Um, the other thing is um, if we have extra time, and I've got a transfer station that, that we have there that's available for use. It allows us some time to be able to work on what does the county want to manage through that station? How, you know, we don't, we don't have to make profit. We're not a for-profit. All we have to do is manage waste for our public and try to make sure that it's a, a sustainable mechanism so that um, we're not talking about this 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the road. We want to find a solution that's going to work for the long term. And this is a tool toward that solution. Um, and, you know, I make, I make estimates based on, on values that, that I see and are reported. Um, and frankly, I don't want to be right. But I would much rather be, uh, be wrong and then be open longer than me be right or wrong and then open less. And, uh, and I don't want to be the solid waste director. I said this to, to, to Chairman Harris. I don't want to be the solid waste director that's, that's on to duty when we have a serious solid waste crisis. And, uh, and I'm, I'm open to and willing to do anything that we see fit to be able to make that, that happen. I, I think the path here, I'm, I'm certain the path here involves, involves this project. And it's your ultimate decision on the timing of that project and what, um, and what you need to, to do to make that, that happen that's going to ultimately make us the heroes or the losers in this, in this deal. But this is a discussion I believe uh, Commissioner Piercy had said some uh, last month was this is a nine-year discussion we're on. Um, it's time to quit talking. Let's, let's get working. The scenario that was just painted, painted out by Mr. Phillips, five years, we've got a transfer station here. There's no way I'll sit here at this table and let a piece of trash be put in our transfer station when we can take it to Republic and help fill it up. We don't have to use it just because we've got it built and sitting there. 
Our transfer station is our plan B. We don't have one. We don't have anything other than pile it up at the homeowner's house. We can use free tipping at Republic until they shut the gate. We don't have to take it to the transfer station. There will be no expense of our transfer station operation till they shut their door. I think, uh, I think Bu uh, Bishop is, is on the right track with his RFP and trying to get the prices for our trans to transfer our trash and our disposal. I think that's our next step. There's no harm, no foul in letting him go forward and with his RFP to find those prices and let him bring that back in here, hopefully when we come back in August. You may can get it by that time. I will make I will make the motion, you may not second it, but we'll make it anyway, to allow him to go forward with that RFP to find cost on transportation of our waste and the disposal of our waste. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Johnson, Anthony Johnson. Uh, do we want to have any further discussion on that? Commissioner? Yeah, I don't mind him doing an RFP, but I'm not ready to say, hey, we're going to start transferring trash out here as long as I've got a right. free place for uh, to take our municipal waste. Right. And I want to make that clear. We, we've made that very clear. I, I'm in 100% agreement with you. I don't want to pay for things we can deal with for free. All right, let's, uh, let's take a vote. All those in favor, signify aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Any, what else, Bishop? Any other questions for Bishop? Thank you, Commissioners, for your time this evening. All right, well, let's take a quick break. Joshua, it looks like you were getting ready to stand up. Phil's already left, so if you'd like to take, let's take a couple minute break, and we'll get IT, uh, we'll get MBL on the on the screen. Okay, uh, we had a, a, a I had a request from uh, one of the the public works commissioners to bring MBL back to the table. Was they have some new information and new partnerships that they've uh, uh, put together since their last visit last year. So, uh, Matthew, can you hear me? Oh, he's going to unmute. I think he's uh, been muted globally there. Okay. Well, that may be a good thing if Matthew's muted. Can you? Matt, wait, let me see if I can get to him. Okay. There you go. Can, you, like can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. All right. So why don't you introduce the folks on your end and uh, go ahead and, and start your introduction. We have Jeremy Petrois, who is the president of business development. And Jeremy is located at our Knoxville office in your great state of Tennessee. Uh, Ingrid is taking notes. She's to my left. And my name is Matthew Linda. Managing member of MBL Technology, located in Wayne, New Jersey. And our Tennessee office is located at Dawn Chase Road in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, August 4th, 2021, MBL made a presentation right where you gentlemen are sitting right now. We brought six individuals, technical people, and put on a presentation that I thought was everything that Rutherford County needed to take care of their solid waste problem. Today, June 6th, we were blessed with permission granted from Chairman Cooch to come back and make another, to paint another picture of what MBL is capable of doing from our last meeting, which in two months will be two years ago. So what we plan on doing, gentlemen, is we have a technology, and I had sent everyone emails on all of our consortium links where we could honestly today and tomorrow say that we could take in your municipal solid waste at a value of 
and Chairman Cooch had sent me approximately 500 tons from uh, Rutherford County and approximately 500 tons from Murfreesboro. But I don't want to get into what's happening in Murfreesboro right now because they're on their own path. Um, we're offering zero waste to Rutherford County. And I have to say that because you have Bishop Wag Wagner there, who is a excellent solid waste director. Bishop knows when I could say that we're going to recycle 98% of whatever is imported, 98%, I need a straight jacket or somebody's going to say that I'm crazy. But that's what I'm promoting right now. That is what we're promoting. And hopefully everybody had an opportunity of looking at our final product from the links that were sent, uh, which included Z1. Z1 is an Argentina company right now that we have a licensing agreement with coming to America. And whatever is left over at the end of the day, and when I say left over, the feedstock after processing municipal solid waste, it's turned into NEV homes, which are building products. And his link is also on the MBL consortium. And it's truly amazing that you could take municipal solid waste, household garbage, that's going to that middle point landfill every single day, 1.2 million tons per year dumped into mother earth and she's getting tired of that and one day they're going to close that place but it wasn't your decision back then when your founders decided to get free tipping and allow that mess to take place we could fix that problem for you we could take 500 tons a day we could take a thousand tons a day we could take 1500 and turn it into renewable building products. We said when we were there the first time that we were involved with the TVA to make fuel cubes, to mix into the boilers for their cogeneration plants that produce electrical energy throughout the Tennessee Valley and all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. Well, the reason why we never pursued that is because we don't know what kind of garbage is manufactured in Tennessee. We know it's in New Jersey, we know it's in Maine, we know it's in San Diego, California, but until we get that product and we get quantities of it and have that analyzed and get analytical reports, we chose to back off and we decided with one of our consortium partners to take the TVA to task and tell them that we could take, and you had a large spill 10 years ago, it's a matter of a, a very big lawsuit by the federal government or to the federal government who owns the TVA, that we could take the ash that they manufacture 24 seven and take all of that toxic, hazardous, nasty materials, lead, mercury, and make it inert and we could turn that into fill material. We have that analytical, which I'm gonna to forward to Chairman Cooch from Covanta Industries, and Covanta is an incineration company worldwide. Covanta doesn't make uh, ash from making electricity. Covanta makes ash from burning garbage exactly the garbage we're talking about now. And that's called fly ash. The TVA has coal ash because they're still burning uh, steam coal. And we're going to make that just like we did with Covanta. And we sent it to Denmark where the facility is up and running. It has been for two years, making a thousand tons a day of toxic material into an inert form of alternate daily cover for landfills, for roadbeds, construction fill, you name it, because now it's inert and it's a product that you don't throw into the ground. So we've come a long way with that. And hearing 
the problems and watching since 2021, every one of your public works meeting. I am seriously interested in getting this done for Rutherford County or else I wouldn't be following 20 some meetings, watching it, listening to people selling you everything from snake oil to vacuum cleaners and none of their technology works. I just wanna go on record with that. MBL has a technology with 60 units across America. 60 units with the proprietary patent from MBL and the CP group. Now, at our meeting of two hours, right in your courthouse there, Josh Wagner from the CP group put a PowerPoint presentation on. And gentlemen, please look at that link under CP. That'll give you a capsule of two hours of our presentation in a 15 minute slide. But it gives you the idea that let's get away from landfilling. I know that the problems that you're having out there and I could certainly understand that it's hard to pay for something when you don't have to. But listening to what you're doing with transfer stations and again, that is your business, Rutherford County, and the taxpayers' money. We could come in here, save that money, because I got to get to the best part of my presentation. MBL and their consortium is going to invest for a thousand ton a day facility, eighty million dollars. Now, at our first meeting, Mayor Ketron at the time, for whatever reason, wanted a PPP, and he wasn't never going to take no for an answer. I fell for that trap. And now I'm telling you that MBL will own and operate that facility, put up $80 million of their money, and the cost to Rutherford County and their taxpayers and the commissioners that are in charge and the chairman of this committee, $0. I'll say it again, I don't want one quarter of your money. Totally different than what's happening in Murfreesboro, where you have a company, and I don't have to mention names, it's the public knows it, they're getting $65 million for 300 tons a day. If that math works, I don't know what to say, then I can't count, but to see and I'll never forget what Chairman Cooch had said when we were leaving. He wants to offer Southern has hospitality to MBL. And he was gracious enough to do that all the time that we were there. I would like something from uh, Rutherford County, which Mayor McFarland is giving to Waste Away, such as He's giving grants, tax incentives, state, federal, green energy money, and all the pork money from the COVID, uh, the COVID money that the president has someplace, and it was never spent. I don't want a quarter from Rutherford County, but if this is an opportunity to get federal money in, I'm offering after one year of operation, when everyone sitting in front of this screen right now sees MBL and the professional leadership of making this not only smooth, profitable, maybe Rutherford County wants to buy into a piece of MBL up to 49% at a fixed number, and then they have control of their garbage forever. So coming out of the box, not a quarter, you tell me how much you want of it once you see how it works. When you see the economic benefits, over 100 new jobs, and not jobs that McDonald's pays or a Wendy's. These are good paying jobs for good people from your state. I, I just think it's time and again, I'm thankful for this opportunity. I could go on and on, but you had a long front end of this meeting. 
I'm honestly thinking right now that I could get better questions from the panel, the commissioners, even Rachel may want to say something, and I hope she does, <laughs> but I'm going to turn it back over right now. And if there's anything that you may need, please fire away. And to the best of my ability, I will answer it. All right, I'm gonna, uh, Robert P's got his hand up. Robert, go ahead. Let's see if he, they can hear you. Well, what I'd like to see is, you know, I, I, I've read about this. Uh, I'm kind of a show me kind of guy, even though I'm from Tennessee, I'd like to see hands on. What is the closest operating facility similar to what you would be proposing for us that we could go see? There's one in Sacramento, California, Bob. And there's one in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. And the one that I mentioned when I was present there in Oneida and Hampton, Maine, rather. And that facility has been closed for it since my meeting of August 2021. It has been closed now for five years because not of the technology. It's because the vendor who was partners with the state of Maine decided that their end product would be pulp. Now, pulp is only good if you want to burn it. And pulp is a designed into the machines because that's what your end product, your specifications required. So when the biggest paper mill in the state of Maine closed down, well, this facility making pulp had no place to go with it. They were going to ship it to California and then to China. And when they realized the cost, they were actually processing the material and then sending it to a landfill. When all of a sudden somebody said, if you're paying the same amount, why process the material? Just send the raw garbage to a landfill. They did that for six months and two days and they filed for bankruptcy and left the state of Maine holding the bag. This is being recreated right now through the bankruptcy court. And I will tell you that once it opens up, and that's a lot closer to go to gentlemen, I will be glad to schedule a meeting to go up there, take pictures. You could wear all brand new hard hats, safety glasses, earplugs, take your cameras, your cell phones. But Robert, you're right. When you could see, touch it, and watch it operate, it's worth a million words. Also, uh, the Sacramento and the Salt Lake City facilities there, can you provide us with uh, contacts that I can call someone in a similar position I'm in that works for the municipality or county for Sacramento or the Salt Lake City facilities? Can you give us contact information to talk to those folks? I will talk to the CP group for their equipment authorization, and they will give to me or to you directly uh, the individuals that you could talk to, but to just decide to take a ride there because of the insurance requirements, we're going to need to schedule it. Uh, and so on and so forth. But yes, absolutely, you could have information from all three locations because those are the ones, except for Maine right now, the other two will be making feedstock slash fluff, which could be turned into making the Nev House products. And some of the new commissioners never saw this. The materials that the old commissioners from our first meeting witnessed. We had a full sample. Your chairman knows it very well. Uh, but yes, we could do that. I don't want to get off track right now, but we could do anything that you gentlemen need because it's been two years since our last meeting. And I don't want to be out in the clothesline saying I should have said that or I should have voiced this. So we could do that, Robert. and. Any other questions? I'm ready. Well, I still got a couple, you know, do you have an estimate on cost per ton it would cost us at the county level here? Say if we did, you said you could build a facility that could do 500 tons or 
thousand tons, whatever number we came up with. If you got an idea on cost per ton, and then uh, after that, operating cost after that first year, if we decided to go into it, yeah, uh, and ongoing cost. Our construct the property construction drawings. It's an eighty million dollar budget to own and operate that facility. We would put together during construction a forensic audit on the last dollar that we spent the day we cut the ribbon. We will cut a deal that day on what an appropriate number may be. And of course, that's according to the percentage that you may, you may want to buy into it. There are a lot of states right now and counties that want to buy uh, like having a franchise, but sadly, because of the proprietary information that's in there, we cannot give up that information or lease out for a county or a state to operate a facility because of the operating expenses, the warranties, the guarantees, and the training that goes into the individuals prior to us turning the main switch on to start the trommel and operation. It's two months, eight hours a day to learn how to put a line in and operate a line. And if your cousin or your buddy next to you gets sick, you'll be able to stand in and do his job. So you got to remember this building is going to be 800 feet by 300 feet. That's 240,000 square feet under one roof. Now you were talking about your transfer stations and so on. We could take as much waste as you want. Uh, Chairman Cooch had said, and he gave me some wonderful information, numbers uh, to the pound that all he's looking for right now for Rutherford County is 500 tons a day. If Murfreesboro joins, then we could handle the thousand tons because you're almost even with the tonnage that you manufacture equally throughout the county. Um, so that's how you establish a number. It's not that we put numbers in a hat and we pick it. Everything will be predetermined, but I want you to see at no cost at all how this operation runs and probably the most important part watching all of your presentations no one said that we're going to teach the public senior citizens children recycling habits i mean you have bleach you have other toxic materials you got to learn how to handle them and then for the school children our future generation. We have tours assigned to walk the facility and you know what happens when young people get excited. They can't stop talking about something that they just witnessed. We're going to give two scholarships out. No other vendor said that, but MBL is different. And we don't want to pick the people. We want the Board of Education for the jurisdiction in Rutherford County to select two individuals every single year, not to go to UT, but to go to a community college. And that scholarship is sponsored by MBL. The creation of 100 to 120 new jobs. I mean, we're doing everything to be a good neighbor. And I could go on and on but there's really no reason for it because we would have to, if we're granted the opportunity to put the facility up, guys could watch it operate, have a price tag on what you're going to own one day, or you could say, we're not interested. we like what you're doing, continue to do it. But Robert, I didn't mention your price yet, and I was getting to that, so I'll cut through the chase. When I was there two years ago, I think I, spewed out $60 a ton for disposal only. Well, 
Republic right now is $99.72 a ton if you're not contracted or if you don't have the amount of garbage. So if you're contracted, then you're on your own to make a deal. If you're like the gentleman that had some C and D from doing his home, he had some lumber, he had some sheetrock, he had whatever in the back of his pickup, that poor young man, uh, I'm sure paid a pretty penny to get rid of it because it goes to a landfill. There you could dump just about everything. And honestly, Republic has, but again, they're in a business to make money and they're doing it very, very well. We're in a business right now to fix and close that facility. And for Rutherford County, together, not separately, pulling away from me, Murfreesboro and so on, as a county plan, because I wrote in an email that I'm thinking that the only people responsible to approve a county plan for solid waste are the commission, the chairman of the commission of public works, the mayor of the county, and the commissioners responsible for the public works committee. Because Rutherford County has 21 commissioners, you may have to up that to 10 people. And I don't think that there's 10 commissioners presently on the board. So in theory, what I'm saying, if you want a county plan and TDEC is the only person in the world or division to get this done for you, they have to approve that. If people want to say different things, then I'm sorry for interfering with their business. But I'm here to promote MBL, their consortium. And I mean, if we're helping the TVA with their ash problem and we're helping Covanta with their ash problem, it's very interesting because I'll give you the Covanta people. They make billions of dollars because they, they take in the garbage and they incinerate it, but they have to pay to get rid of the ash. And they pay dearly for it because it's hazardous and it's toxic. We fix that for them. They're very happy people right now. We're doing the same thing or we're attempting to with a gentleman by the name of uh, Michael Scott Turnbow. Scott is a PhD, brilliant young man, and he's the one that's involved right now with ash remediation, which is part of the MBL consortium. So it's interesting because after our meeting two years ago, where we went to, we could have hid in a cave, we could have cried foul, we're moving forward and we're bringing even more of a product to Rutherford County, Tennessee. Did I help you with that, Robert? You did. Uh, I caught that uh, Republic's current cost per ton was $99.72 a ton, but I didn't catch yours. I had said at my meeting two years ago, $60 a ton, and let's see how we go with it to find out what the true number should be. And, you know, you're talking numbers right now for garbage going to your transfer stations. You will have accurate numbers for transportation and disposal of your material that you make every single day, but you're not processing it. You're bringing your waste to another county to give them a headache when solid waste is here for you it's here today it was here two years ago the opportunity exists and i wish i could give you a number right now but without looking at some of the uh, reports from bishop wagner i'll stay at 60 dollars right now as a budgetary number for disposal only thank you you're welcome Matthew, Mike Cush here, a couple of questions. Um, is there 
is there a NEV house processing in the U.S. somewhere? No. Okay. Uh, I remember when we last talked, Sacramento was a close to what we were looking at, but it did not have the NEV house, NEV house bolt on, and I was just curious if that had happened yet. All right, so, so let me ask you this question. Do we as a county, and you know, this is kind of going back to that hospitality comment I made, but you know, we want you to succeed. We want you to make sure you have contracts in hand because you know, if you succeed, we succeed. Do we need to be concerned about whether you're making building materials or fluff or ash? Do we care? That, or is that, we just leave that up to you to do whatever you want to in your dirty MRF that you would have to build here? Well, I know TDEC is gonna say, uh, Chairman, and thank you for that question, that that floor has to be cleaned by five o'clock every day. So the reason why we showed our links to our consortium partners, there's a Argentina company called Z1. Z1 will pick up everything that's on that floor and turn it into masonry blocks. You have to see their website. We have a licensing agreement. We have a vested interest in Z1 and that's probably the best thing that we could do is at the end of the day, have a clean floor and make products such as Nev Home products, blocks from Z1, and who knows, maybe with the analyticals, if they work okay, we could turn that into fuel cubes for the TVA to put into their coal-fired cogen plants, into their boilers, and make electricity. But our job is, at the end, five o'clock, at the end of the work shift, that floor has to be spotless and not thrown out the door and worry about it tomorrow. It's going to be built into the permit. We have a permit by rule already with TDEC, but that was for Scott County. It could be easily transferred to Rutherford County. And we've done our homework, men. We know what we have to do out there. But again, we're not gonna be making any ash, uh, Chairman. The ash is made when you burn something and Covanta burns garbage and the TVA burns coal to make electric. Okay, so, so Matthew, uh, again, uh, do, do we need to be concerned or, or say, hey, before we do anything, we need to see contracts in hand with whoever is buying the uh, Z1 bricks or tiles, or or do we need to see contracts from Home Depot? Or I remember we talked about Clayton Homes. You were heading from our last meeting to Clayton Homes to try and get an order for four by eight sheets. Um, do we need to be concerned about orders or contracts in your hands for products, or do we just blindly trust you and say, build your $80 million facility, and we don't care how you get rid of it as long as the floor is clean by the end of the day, and, you get, and you're gonna get a 90 to 98% diversion rate? We will have that floor clean. If we sell it to Clayton Homes, and again, we have to have the product so we could go sell the sample. We will sell it to the TVA. If we had a product, we could make a sample. But let's assume right now that we have nothing, no agreements, no invoices, no deals with Clayton Homes, uh, Home Depot, uh, Lowe's. We, we have no deals whatsoever. We could get rid of the product and make concrete block that's one third the weight of a regular household or construction block, not cinder, concrete block, the same tensile strength as that block. So we'll be making blocks. So now you're gonna say, boy, you're gonna have to make a lot of blocks. 
which is really not true because a quick math lesson, if we import 500 tons of your garbage, 50% of that is automatically recyclables. People will argue that, but it's a world famous number. 50% in the black bag will be recyclables. 30% of the rest of it is moisture. Now we're left with 20% of your total 500 tons per day. That'll make a lot of blocks, but it's not gonna go from floor to ceiling. But in the interim, while we're manufacturing all of this material, that's when our R&D starts getting creative by making other products, which are probably more valuable than the ones that we're presently making. Because if we're going from 500 tons a day, and then Murphy's Barrel realizes we made a mistake, would you take our garbage? We have room because if you're going to construct a building, you don't construct a little building. You construct a large one to have the room for expansion. Because if a building's up and let's say it's 100,000 feet and we only got one line in, in three months we're gonna wish that we had a bigger building because the garbage exists there and I understand the rules that Rutherford County's proposing. Just Rutherford County garbage. You guys have been dumped on in Rutherford County for a long time. There's nothing you could do about the Middle Point landfill. We're talking about Rutherford County garbage only. You'll have your own to perpetuity. You know where your garbage is going. You don't have to own it, but it's offered to you. And you don't have to put up a penny because we're gonna take care of that. I mean, that's like Silicon Valley Bank saying that they're sorry. And I'm sure that they are. But if it wasn't for the government, all those people would have went broke. But they got their money back because they had a guarantee from the federal government. Yeah. Uh, last time we chatted, uh, equipment was about 18 months out. Is that still uh, a good rule of thumb? Actually, I had said 12 months. Okay. Now, with the pandemic that took place, the shortage of steel, the shortage of building products, uh, the transportation of getting uh, material and equipment back and forth, maybe your number of 18 months is more accurate today. But you met Josh Wagner. If we do get a letter of intent to move forward because you like the way that the deal sounds, then I could get you a progress schedule that is accurate by just going from 12 months which I predicted to 18 months with the extension that's really required. I'm hoping to get it done in 10 months, but we know that that's not gonna happen. And that we will do our best because in our contracts, we have a royalty clause and we certainly have a penalty clause. If you say it's gonna be 12 months and we're into 13 and 14 months, you're gonna pay a penalty, not you, the contractor. If you give, get it done in 10 months, now you're gonna get a royalty clause. It's the way to make your contractors work with you. And don't forget, Cambridge is part of the MBL umbrella, who is the general contractor of record. Okay. You know, when I was there last time, you, you were talking about uh, Pratt as being your recycling, um, vendor of record and then you were talking i believe with rockwell because of your construction and demolition debris we were going to that 25 acre site which during the watch me watching the meetings uh, that's out of the question right now and you decided to go with uh, the two transfer stations but i always said it up on top of the landfill and i believe there's 200 acres up there one big building could be your eco center. 
you could have your solid waste in one building, you could have all your C and D being processed in a much smaller building, <coughs> and you could have your recycling center up there because we're going to take 50% of what's delivered, which has cardboard, metals, glass, you name it. MBO will have to go out and sell it. But if you had somebody right next door that is in a recycling business, now you're making it into a friendly operation. They don't have to get somebody to come 50 miles or 100 miles to pick up a load of baled cardboard or baled uh, ferrous metal or whatever, or 50 a container with broken glass, commingled, or all different colors. Your recycling program, and I witnessed it, it's very good. I heard the percentage that you're trying to get to. I could make 98% work, and hopefully Bishop did not pass out when I said that. Matthew, refresh our memory. How, how many acres would be ideal for your facility? 20 acres would be perfect. And that's what an infrastructure, and it's not going to look like up on top of that hill looking at that landfill. This will be a first class operation and not like a, we're giving you a top tier 240,000 square foot building. The infrastructure will even look better. It's gonna have two scales, one scale in, one scale out. No traffic problems. You already have the, uh, the traffic problems. You have the traffic study. Uh, you're going into a different direction right now. You're not gonna be on that pike, the road with the traffic and we saw it, we took pictures of it. It's a pain, but that's part of life. Probably it's a half a mile down the road, maybe even longer to the entry to get into the top of the hill. That's where I would like to put it, where you have 200 or 300 acres up there. Robert knows it, Steve Piercy knows it, all the commissioners know it, uh, and I'm sure even the new commissioners. All right, Matthew, I'm, I'm looking at my old notes and I have two more points that I wanna make before I, I turn it over to some other folks. I see in my old notes that there was a comment about a half a million dollar host fee annually. Is that still on the table? Yes, it is. And I also see a note that says a dollar per ton extra for out of county trash. Um, you know our feeling about out of county trash, but if, if we were to open it up for that, is there, a, is there a surcharge, I guess, available for taking in out-of-county trash? The community host fee that I promised you two years ago is still there. Uh, a half a million dollars, in my mind, is like $10,000 a week coming as a revenue to the county. And if you allow out-of-county garbage, we will give you a dollar extra host fee on that tonnage coming from out-of-county. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Questions, anybody? Yeah. You have some, Anthony? Mr. Chairman. All yeah. right, uh, I'm gonna turn you over to Anthony Johnson, Matthew. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, how are you, sir? Doing fine, how are you? Good, thank you. Good. Uh, we're in the process of looking at, well, we are in the process of, of going forward with a transfer station. And we all know we, I'm assuming we all know that we need that and we're pursuing that. You're willing to build a transfer station, basically, that's what it is, at $80 million at no cost to us. Is That's exactly right. What would happen, because my problem is, if you don't meet your requirements, within a certain amount of time, whatever our contract would be. If you don't meet your requirements, then we're back to square one. We don't have a building. 
but we're in big trouble. We're still back to even 10 years ago where we were. What guarantee would we have that we would have a building? Would you be willing to have in the contract that that building would revert back to us, go back to New Jersey, wherever? <laughs> well, I, I think that would be a tough call. Uh, but Commissioner Johnson, I will put together, and again, this has to be you pull, I pull. If we fail, God forbid we fail, what am I going to do with that building? What am I going to do with the equipment that's inside of it? But that's salvageable. I could get that equipment moved at an additional cost, a very big cost, and we'll put a contract together where I just left the leadership of Rutherford County, a 240,000 square foot building, less the equipment inside, which includes scales, everything there except the equipment, because that equipment is the heart and soul. The building, you know what you could build a steel skin building for, but you know, it's huge. You got 35 foot clear spans inside, but it's a steel building. So I'm gonna answer your question and that was a very good question for me to answer and give up. And I don't think that your transfer station is anywhere near 240,000 square feet. And whatever that price may be, save that money and you got a big transfer station. And that'll be in the contract agreement. And the reason why I'm so, what's the right word? I'm saying this with such confidence is I have no intentions of coming all the way to Rutherford County and fail. These things work too well. We've got too much time invested. They work like a Swiss watch. And that's why I'm giving you the opportunity, watch it work, and then tell me how much you wanna buy of it. Thank you. Uh, I have welcome, some more qu questions. Yeah, we'll continue on. Okay. Um, you mentioned a TVA contract. Do you have a contract at this time with TVA? And, no, the, reason, sir. and the reason I ask that because it's my understanding someone else is working on a contract to work with TVA. I know exactly where you're going with that commissioner. We do not have a contract for our fuel cubes or processing their ash. We are in the talking stage and I gave you the individual's name, Michael Scott Turnbow. He's from Chattanooga, from the Chattanooga office to the Knoxville office. And of course, Memphis and Knoxville. Um, he's our contact there. We had at least two or three Zooms. We're waiting for him to put together a scope sheet and send us, like we did with Covanta, we got a five gallon can of this hazardous material. It was sealed, signed by the individual in a hazmat suit, and we transported it internationally to Denmark and they processed it. And I've got the analytical to show not only Scott Turnbow, but to the members of this committee, it's the limits are less than the EPA of America. And it was done in Denmark. Denmark, we could bring right over here. And that's what's gonna happen with Covanta, locate one at their largest facility, which is in Newark, New Jersey, and we're doing the world good things because they make money on everything they touch. Now they're gonna make money by selling ash instead of paying for it. Because our deal is once we process it, I'm gonna give the material back to you. It's a pretty good deal for everybody. 
Thank, thank you. <clears throat> I guess one last question. Um, tonnage per day, would we have to guarantee you a minimum tonnage per day or week or month? Uh, that was a question that when I was there with the presentation, I insisted on a thousand tons a day. Um, and the reason being is at that time, two years ago, that's the amount of garbage that the entire county processed, not processed, manufactured. Those numbers came from um, your solid waste director, uh, Nolan, Mac Nolan. I got those figures from Mac and Mac went to, I believe, Davidson County or wherever, Williamson County, and now you have Bishop. But those were those numbers were, and that's why we always used a thousand tons a day. But we will put this facility up, the size of the building with the expansion underneath that roof for another line and two of z ones equipment their lines. So now you're gonna have four lines in that building. One is operational for your 500 tons a day, Rutherford County, and not one garbage can from Murfreesboro. And one of the Z1 equipments to pick up everything that's left on the floor at the end of the day. So if we could get a thousand tons a day, then my my $80 million price tag is perfect. If we only get 500 tons and then use one CP line, then we're down to maybe 50, 60 million. But you're going to need that second line down the road and I would rather build it all at once. But to answer your question, 500 tons a day, we could be operational and profitable. So that would be our minimum. That would be your minimum. I now, Commission, I, I'm sorry, Chairman Cooch, am I correct with the numbers that you sent me, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. I, I did have one other question, I guess. Uh, you're saying the tipping fee would be $60 a ton versus $90 a ton for Republic. I, I think I understood that. Okay. Actually, uh, I got a statement from Republic just <clears throat> calling up like a uh, Tennessee Carter and for me to deliver. And again, it was a small amount, but it seems that their gate rate right now is $99 and 72 cents a ton. And it has been since April of 22. Now, this is in your backyard. These are the people that are, uh, operating that landfill. Bishop knows the number. It has to be right there or unless you have a good deal. And an example is Putnam County. They had one of these vendors that came in front of your board and we're gonna go to Putnam County and put up this miracle anaerobic digester. No, nope. I'd like you to look at Putnam County and see what happened to that technology. But at this time, we're looking at, I mean, we have a host fee and all, we, we're not paying any, we're not paying that tipping fee. And like- Oh, I know you're not. And You've like, been getting away with it, not, not away with it. Somebody cut a very good deal to have all of Tennessee come and dump in your county to have a zero dollar disposal fee. Right. For eight years, for eight years, I'm thinking that this committee is trying to change that and get their own technology and take care of their own waste. And in discussion earlier, hope that that landfill closes in two and a half years. Yes, sir. But as Commissioner Piercy said, and I think we're all, well, a majority of us are in agreement anyway, I think, uh, we're not gonna pay a tipping fee until Republic closes, we, and then we'll have to pay somebody. 
um, that puts us in a predicament with a contract with, with you because you're going to have us paying a tipping fee before it's time to pay a tipping fee. I guess that's the way I'm looking at it. Commissioner Johnson, are you right now in the design phase of your transfer stations? Correct. Aren't you very close ahead of schedule on breaking ground there soon? Yes, sir. Before August, aren't you getting a RFP on transfer transportation and disposal that you will have to pay from zero dollars? Correct. I, then I you'll the see point. the number which really exists out there when you have somebody taking your garbage from Rutherford County someplace else for transportation and disposal. Because why would you build a transfer station if your tipping fee is zero dollars? Or why would you buy a or purchase part of an MBL system if you're still at zero dollars? It's counterproductive because one day you're going to have to pay a tipping fee. That's correct. We just don't know what that tipping fee will be. You will before your next meeting in August. Yes, sir. Thank be you. Because Bishop will be getting those numbers and you'll know those numbers. You probably have some right now because people are interested to fill up their landfills and uh, make other counties miserable because taking your garbage to them is not technology. It's just transferring garbage. That's why it's called the transfer station. Yes, sir. And that's one thing I'm, I've been looking at the whole time, and, and I hope everyone is, is we don't want to continue on the path that we're, we're on now, and that's burying garbage. And just having a transfer station by itself, we're still going to be burying garbage. We're just going to send it somewhere else and let somebody else bury it which is a plus for us, but still, well, sort of a plus for us, but we do need to get away, everyone needs to get away from burying trash. Thank you, sir, for your, all of your information, and I appreciate your time. Well, thank you for your questions. All right, we've got, we've got another question from uh, Commissioner Phil Dodd. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Matthew. Um, since you spoke to us last time, how many facilities have you sold? How many deals have you cut? How many counties have you encouraged to buy into the deal you're articulating to us again tonight? Commissioner Dowd, I'm gonna send you my list that my lender just asked me for yesterday. We have six locations right now for an MBL system. And it would be my pleasure to give it to you so you could call up and make sure that I'm telling you the absolute truth. I'll give you the amount that the facilities are budgeted for, the name of the contact person at that location. And actually it's interesting because the latest one is from the Bahamas, which doesn't belong to the United States. And I found it interesting that they found MBL through their website and from other states and counties in America throughout the United States. So it's a compliment that we're getting. Our arms are reaching into international islands now. And I'll be honest with you, I'd love to go to the Bahamas. I'd love to go to Freeport, Nassau, and put two or three of these things up if necessary. But from our last meeting to this second, none. Because it takes as long, well, you guys understand what I'm talking about. How long does it take to get one totally approved with everybody on board? And I do this 24 seven. I thought you said but six. But now we have six, seven, maybe eight, but you're going to see them because that question, I guess it's relevant. So Matthew, I thought you said six locations. Now, but, it's, but now you just said zero since our last meeting. No, zero of one built okay. from our last meeting. I think uh, Commissioner Dodd had said, how many have I built since our last meeting? 
Okay. Is that correct, sir? No, sir. It was how many deals have you cut? How many counties have bought in? How many people have succumbed to this sales tactic? That's what I was trying to get at. Mr. P asked how many facilities, there were three, one of which is bankrupt. Now there's six more that are potentially coming. So I would love to get the six. That would be a good a good action step. If if it needs to be confidential, share it with Chairman Cush and, and see the what locations and tonnage per day the five or six facilities are. That I could do. But let, let me go back to where you were. There was only three locations making the material that we need that is an equal to what we're gonna do in Rutherford County. And that's in Sacramento, Salt Lake City. And once the one in Hampton, Maine goes back online, that will be the one where we could all go see, we could take the pictures and you know what's gonna happen there. Or if you wanna to go to Utah, get your skis and I'll meet you there. All right. All right, I have, I have one last question, Matthew. Uh, and, and this is, I can't get out of my head since I asked it earlier. It, it sounds like off the get go, you would be having Z1 be the primary um, focus in Rutherford County and that would be making bricks or tile or, or some type of a building material out of uh, a lightweight aggregate I think you mentioned uh, and, and making block. Is, is there another facility in the U.S. that they are producing this block? No, sir. Okay. The only place they're producing that block is if you look at the Z1 uh, website, which is on my links that I sent to every commissioner in your state, or in your county, rather, and you'll see they're from Argentina. Yep. Material coming in and blocks coming out at the end. And that is not our primary uh, equipment. CP Group, who does 50 tons an hour, that's the main line that we're using there. Z1 does 100 tons per day. So roughly that's 12 tons per hour okay. for Z1. So, so Matthew, help, help me understand who, who would be the buyer of these blocks manufactured in Rutherford County? Uh, I didn't get to that point yet because we don't have a sample for me to go sell like an insurance policy or a used car. But well, when you look at the specification sheets and if you're into construction or you're an architect of record, you'll see that this is the newest way out of garbage and it's being done already. I mean, people are making blocks out of just strict plastic. People are making decking now out of strict plastic. It's not all brand new. This has been around for, you got Trek decking, probably the most popular material for an outside deck, all plastic. Right, all right. I, I, I'm in the construction business, as is Commissioner Dodd. We, we both understand ASTM specifications and city and DOT specifications. And I, I have seen samples of lightweight aggregate, lightweight block materials for decades. And to be honest with you, I haven't seen one put in the ground because the specs aren't there right, on the municipal or DOT side. Now, if I was building a uh, shed in my backyard, I could probably do that, but nothing would be to meet a building code or a DOT or municipal specification that would, uh, as of yet, that would uh, allow these blocks to be used. And that's the concern I have is, you know, it's, it's kind of like the Wrigley's chewing gum you know, they they sold the gum at the World's Fair before they ever manufactured a stick of gum. That turned out to be a success story, but I'm, I'm concerned about an Argentine company that has zero, zero exposure in the U.S. making a block 
made out of municipal solid waste competing in a block industry that there is tons of competition in the state of Tennessee, including right here in the dealers and suppliers in, in Rutherford County. I, I just, man, I just, I, I don't understand the business side of it. I'm not a business major, don't claim to be a businessman, but I just don't see how that works. But that's the part I can't get through my head is how in the world could you sell that block here or anywhere within a close proximity uh, to make that a viable product for you. But um, that, that's- Chairman, I'm gonna get you a sample of that block with a spec sheet. Okay. It'll right. be delivered to your office from Argentina. And let's assume that it doesn't meet the standards, as you said, being a contractor, a builder. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at our, or the Z1 site, they make different products similar to Nev Homes. See, this is, this is something that happened the last time we were there. And Commissioner Dodd was extremely emphatic about how much are you gonna make for this or what can you sell that for? And these are they're very good questions. But until we make a product, we don't know. But if that would stop Rutherford County thinking that the blocks won't make it or that won't make it to get a project to get away from that landfill and finally have an answer to your problem. I, I honestly don't know what to say after that. All right, all right. A any other questions? Robert, anybody, Steve? Robert's got another comment. This is my last question. I asked everybody, you've been watching for 20 months, you know this question already. If we dig up our old landfill, can you process that stuff with your equipment? Or rather, Robert, would you? I, th I think you asked me that question last time, and uh, the answer is no, and the answer is no for one particular reason. Whoever you contract that to, if you think that there is a stench in that valley where that landfill is located, my God, please don't mine that landfill. I know it's a problem. I know it wasn't lined. But when you open that up, there's stuff down there that's been cooking 50, 60 years. And where are you going to get rid of it? you're gonna to have to bring it to another landfill because there's no technology out there that could process that. I mean, it's stink, rot, there's nothing left to it. So now you're gonna pay ridiculous amounts of money, A, to a contractor to mine it, and then you have to get rid of the debris. Now, maybe you could get rid of the debris right there for um, Republic's middle point landfill i mean if you could tip for free i would start throwing it in that hole right now <laughs> because without that being free you don't have enough zeros in your budget or the state of tennessee to pay for it it's going to be monstrous All right, uh, our, we, uh, I think our questions are, are at end here, Matthew. Any closing comments for you or Jeremy or Ingrid? Jeremy, you have anything? No, I mean, certainly, uh, certainly covered a lot of different topics, but um, we will certainly do what we can to get some of these questions further answered. Um, it seems like uh, Matt's really been talking as much as he possibly can to, to, to do so. So I really appreciate everyone for their, for their time here today. All right, well, we, we will sleep on this process, what we've, uh, what we've heard tonight. Uh, ideally, you would like a letter of intent, it sounds like, to, to move forward. Uh, but we'll, we'll discuss that. Uh, would, uh, we, we, uh, we may still have some of your sample, Nev House samples uh, in the office here that I will share with some of the new uh, members of the committee, uh, Matthew. It, it is impressive for sure, uh, but a, a block, if you would like to send a sample of the block 
that would be fine. You can send it to the courthouse to my attention uh, or to Rachel's attention. Uh, that would be uh, great, and I will share that sample uh, with you. You've heard uh, some of our concerns, and if you want to uh, have a, a better, uh, after you sleep on it and have a better message to send to us, we'll be happy to continue the dialogue. So, gentlemen and Ingrid, thank you very much. Uh, we will conclude the team's meeting, and uh, again, thank you, and safe travels. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Perfect. Matthew. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks. Have a great uh, evening. Do we have any other business? I can't think of any. Um, as of now, we do not have a July meeting uh, unless you hear from, I guess would be you or I uh, and Doug DeMossi from planning in case he has something that has to be heard. Uh, we will not have a July meeting unless you hear different. So other than that, have safe travels. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I, I hope this is you, that you got some information out of this, and uh, uh, it's a neat concept, but boy, howdy. We would be a guinea pig for sure, you know. Mr. Chairman, wouldn't this, wouldn't this concept, if, if uh, Republic has a number of years left, and if we do some things to even extend the life of that con that landfill, wouldn't it be prudent for us to explore something like this later rather than now? Uh, is now the perfect time, or wouldn't it be when the, when we know that there's a date out there that the landfill would close? W wouldn't wouldn't we be better off to pursue something like this at that time? Uh, well, my, my gut my gut answer is yes, but I, you know, Mike, I, I'm just a I'm just a regular guy, and what scares me is I mean the story is a is a neat story, but if you cannot produce a pile of contracts of yes, these people are gonna buy, they have committed to buy from me. Whether it's block, whether it's Nev House building products, whether it's ash, whether it's a letter from the TVA that says yes, I will burn, whether it's a letter from the cement kilns that says yes, I'll burn your fluff, they got nothing, zero. That scares me. I don't care if we're investing zero dollars that scares me. That, that's the snake oil thing to me. I, I, I can't get over that. Susan, do you have, <laughs> you've, you've sat here with meetings, you, you're one of us. I mean, I just don't, it doesn't make sense. I think that would be the point, is, is now may not be the perfect time. Yeah. At some point in time, it may be that we could revisit this thing yeah. uh, if, if need be. The, the concept sounds kind of cool it, it does but however do, do we need to do that right, right now or would it be better if we knew that the landfill was going to close in two years if we knew that yeah. uh, then we would pursue something like this I think I, I would like personally I would like to see the facility in Sacramento and see what it is producing and talk uh, chairman P asked for names to talk to city or city or county officials I would like to have a conversation with them and get their take. But the other part that came up tonight for the first time, which hasn't come up, came up with our other meetings is the word franchise. You, I'm sure you all caught that. That was, that was a new one. You know, after the first year, if you like what you see, you can buy into it. And he used the word franchise. Yeah, I've, I've got some friends that have been in the franchise business and man, that's another scary thing for a county to consider. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. We can, we can have this conversation at a, another day and another time, but thank you all for your, for your, your patience. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>